So, now having understood the connectivity, the actual physical connectivity, let us come to the OSI network architecture. A typical, a very generic general purpose network, this is a very general purpose model and in, in the various special networks, uh, you have you have a you have some sort of an adaptation of these network architecture. In all networks, adapt this generic OSI network architecture in in certain ways. So, in the generic standard, you have actually when over a network, when we when one computer talks to the another to another, it need not know what is the network connectivity, what is the address. You just you know you when you when, you, when one person chats with another person over over a long distance sometimes over the globe. So, it is it is actually a virtual communication, but actually physically these these data or the text suppose which you are typing has to physically travel from your network across various communication channels and physically reach the other computer which may be thousands of miles away. So, this is achieved through a layer of protocols. Okay? Each protocol gives a service to the protocol above, so that the protocol above and, and 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 hides certain unnecessary details from the from from the protocol above so this is the protocol above always sees its own communication as a as across some across some virtual channel and is freed from several you know technical details otherwise it would have been i mean absolutely impossible for us to to do any communication over over a network so so the communication is actually goes is whole system is actually organized in layers and any message which is generated at a, at, a, at, a, at a top layer will come down across the layers, finally reach the communication channel and the, the electrical communication, then it will travel across various you know uh, nodes and then finally will go up and reach the top layer of the destination uh, process. So, you have typically you have physical layer which is actually the electrical layer where the actual electrical communication takes place, modulation communication over any medium, fiber optic, radio, wire, whatever. Data link layer is the next layer which actually provides, uh, increases the, the, the reliability of the electrical communication. So, here the data is not, it, it is still treated as you know binary data, packets are assembled, error codes are uh, attached so that during transmission if some data error occurs that can be detected. These transport and network layers actually uh, take care of the networking problems. So, firstly it does things like routing. So, if you want to trans, if you want, if you are sending an email message from here to Japan from your say your uh, host to whom you send, where should it go? So, this, this kind of the, the, this kind of routing information is uh, routing is done by network layer. Then there are sometimes you know they they do you know things like congestion control. So some particular channels may be may be down, they may be choked. So if data is not going through these channels, they will they will there are there are mechanisms by by which uh, people can do things like flow control. So this network and transport layers actually. Uh, take care of the network topology, loading and network communication. So, once you have taken care of these from the session and presentation layers, it appears as if you have a, this is the physical communication, this is the physical communication, digital communication, this is the network configuration and network performance ensuring. So, once you have these two layers, these layers sitting on this and this actually sees a, some kind of a virtual session between two computers. So, it does not know, it is completely oblivious of how through which path in the network this particular message is going. So, it does not know, it just knows, so it, it sets a session. Presentation layers are generally uh, rudimentary, they, they are not uh, very strong and it is the application layer which is, you know application layers are, are configured for typical uh, typical kinds of application like you know you, you want to have a remote terminal so you your your you want your pc to actually work as a as a terminal to a server which may be elsewhere on the network so this is a this is a remote terminal service there can be an email service right so so these these 
various kinds of common kinds of applications, various kinds of FTP service, so file transfer. So such app things are uh, the particular details of these are actually handled by the application layer. And the application layer once, so then the, then the application layer actually calls a session layer, calls the session layer and says that you please set up a session for this particular application. And then the session layer gives those its, its session uh, messages to the transport and network layer which decides how it will go and then they actually finally puts all the addresses etc and then finally these get to the data link layer and then they actually are transmitted in the medium. The user layer, not normally this user layer in this is OSI network layer is uh, network architecture is actually a seven layer protocol which does not have the user layer because for general purpose computing the user layer can be of enormous variety. So therefore the user layer is actually not specified. But as we will see that in the particular case of industrial automation networks this is adapted right. So what is done is we will we'll skip these slides and see the field bus network architecture. So in the field bus network architecture there are, there are, there are certain uh, differences. So first difference is that the network in, in the factory is actually fixed, it does not change. Second thing is that the what kind of messages that is the loading on the network, how many messages are coming, frequency of messages arriving on the network are also more or less constant because you know all the time I mean once it is designed it is fixed, it is not that uh, uh, new processes are being I mean large number of new processes can be suddenly generated because we know what kind of computations are actually going on in this in this <coughs> network. So therefore this you know this what I mean to say is that the transport and network layer functionality is nearly removed. So therefore it is good to remove the transport and network layer therefore the field bus network actually does not have actually has very rudimentary transport and network layer right. So, <coughs> so it has a physical layer it also has the data link layer which you know does also part of the little bit of it actually puts the addresses uh, it actually ensures the that, that is who will transmit when say the say, say the medium access protocol etc for cyclic and acyclic communication is, is also hand, handled in the data link layer. And this layer 3 through, through 6 that means session, presentation and application are actually, actually application is there 3 to 5 I, I would say uh, physical data link, uh, network transport and session layers, networks now 3 to 3 through 6 networks, transport, session and presentation these 4 layers are actually removed. Then on top of that you have an you have an application layer which application layer is so you have field bus application layer which is broken into two sub layers one is called the field bus message sub layer the other is called the the, the field bus access sub layer. So uh, uh, using the, so the, the, the field bus access sub layer provides various kinds of addressing uh, addressing functionality and the field bus message sub layer actually. Uh, configures the, the, the messages which are coming from the user layer. So in contrast the field bus network proposes an, a major user layer because here the computations are not of that much variety number one they are largely uniform they are, they are, they are all for process automation tasks and, and secondly because of the fact that you know uh, it is necessary for easy configurability it, it, it is necessary that the so enormous flexibility is actually not needed. So you can you can create various kinds of uh, templates and you can you can create a separate layer within which it will be it will be easier for the for the application engineer for the for the process engineer to actually program his application. So therefore a, an user layer is proposed. So one layer is added and four layers are deleted. So you have a this is the field bus protocol structure. So you have finally the field bus architecture. So you have the physical layer, the data link layer and the application layer broken up into two parts and then you have the user and uh, user layer which involves feed uh, the function blocks which are you know abstract 
uh, computing blocks which specify abstract communication, let us say between, between an analog input device and a process controller or a process controller and an analog output device. So the, it, it will just abstractly describe this in terms of function blocks and then the network uh, communication through this, I mean among these function blocks will be, will be automatically realized by this part of the network, right. So, <coughs> so this is the this is the field bus protocol. In this lesson, we will be mainly concentrating on the data link layer and the physical layer. Physical layer we have already discussed and in the next lecture, we will be talking about the user layer and the field bus application layer. So the field bus, as, as I was telling, it defines user layer for interoperability so that you know every, every device, so all the field bus devices are, have to be of a certain, have to be of a certain standard as far as software interfacing or data formats are concerned. So those data formats have been already specified in the standard and any field bus device must comply with that standard so that they, they can be become immediately interoperable. And these are defined in the user layer protocols. The field bus message specification, so the user layer just abstractly gives, so, so maybe there may be an analog input block simply in its user layer, it, it, it simply generates a value. So this particular temperature signal has to go to the PID controller, it says. Now for transmitting that to the PID controller, this has to be actually made into a message and then a message has to be configured into a packet and then it has to be sent with after all the addressing etc. So the field bus message specification, the field bus message specification actually builds up the builds up the message data structure for communication as per requirements and in fact there may be several function block processes within a device. So all these devices frequently are generating data so they have to be put in the form of messages and then transmitted. And then the field bus access sub layer, once it gets the packet, this is to be transmitted, then it, then the field bus access sub layer adds, you know, addresses and the networking information such that this can actually reach another device on the bus. You know, each device has, has a unique address so, and, and, and unless you, since there is a shared medium, unless you transmit your messages, unless your messages contain addresses, the devices will not be able to understand whether a, whether a particular data that it has seen because everybody is actually listening on the same bus. People are transmitting on the same bus and every device is actually listening on the same bus and picking up the data which is meant for it. So the field bus access sub layer provides in this way by providing addresses provides a virtual communication channel so that nobody, the top layers do not need to worry about how this, how each device is actually sensing and then picking up the data meant for it. So it need not bother about that. The data link layer actually manages the communication protocol. It takes care of the, the digital communication details, error coding, parity checking, etc. And the physical layer provides the, the electrical and medium dependent. So if you have wire, uh, if you have RF, then there has to be radio transmission. If you have fiber optics, then there has to be optical communication. So all these details are handled by the physical layers. And okay, levels to three to six are dropped for efficiency. So, without going into the physical layer, because that involves a lot of you know electronics basically, and generally communication electronics. So we don't want to get into that in this course. So rather, we look at the data link layer. In the data link layer, the features are uh, that you have centralized bus mastership. This is very important to understand because the, because you are having a bus on which everything is hanging, right? So if you talk, if a particular device transmits on this bus, there is signal existing everywhere on this connector. So all the other devices can get it. And it is very important that no two, two devices never transmit data on at the same time on the medium because then the data is going to be garbled. So therefore there has to be a there has to be a device which will decide who will speak at what time on the bus. So this is achieved by what is known as bus mastership. So the bus master distributes the right to transmit among the devices depending on their needs and depending on how you have configured it. Communication can be cyclic as well as cyclic that is some devices will every 
say one second they, they will send a packet. So, they require cyclic communication. There are some maybe acyclic where which will be suddenly required maybe due to some alarm condition and things like that. So, these two kinds of communication are supported by the data link layers and sometimes you have features for connection oriented as well as connection less data transfer. This is connection less. So, you can have broadcast where you are not giving addresses or you can have a connection oriented that, it, that this is meant for only this node only, right. So, this, these are supported by the data link layer. So, pictorially it looks like this. So, on the bus, this is the field bus. There are various devices. These are basic devices, BD basic devices and these are link masters. So, LM is a kind of device which is capable of becoming a link master and the and there is among the link masters there is a particular device which is called the active link link active scheduler so at this time this this is a, this link master can also become the link active scheduler but it is at this time idle. So, these are idle. Sometimes you provide more link masters because if but for some reason this link master fails, then who will ensure the communication? So, there are some other link masters which are always kept in hot standby so that they will they can they can immediately take over the communication and the control and coordination will continue. This is very important, right. So, exactly same diagram, this is repeated. So, th these are link masters and their basic devices. Basic devices are not capable of becoming link masters or link active schedulers, while link masters are capable of becoming link active schedulers. So, LD is a linking device, uh, LD interfaces H1 segments with an HSE or I do not know what HSE means. Link master, that is what I said, BD is basic device, a device not capable of becoming a link master. So, link active scheduler is, the, is as I said, it, it is a bus master which distributes right to transmit to all devices. It is actually a functionality, some, some software which may be, may be present in several link masters for fault tolerance and it is actually, it actually does the scheduling of the various, you know, soft and hard real time communication tasks. So, soft real time communication tasks are those which also need to be finished in time, but even if they are slightly delayed, there is not so much of a problem, but hard real time tasks are those. If you cannot finish those tasks, those computing and communication tasks in time, then the system may completely collapse, right. So, it, it must so for you in your scheduling, you have to take care such that the hard real time tasks are, are definitely finished within time. So, the link, link active scheduler also has to, you know, the, these you can always keep on as, as we said that there is easy configurability. So, you can add a device simply to the network and the link active scheduler also has to look for whether some new device has been connected and then has to configure them and then have to take care of their communication needs. So, it also searches for added and removed devices. Similarly, it, if a device is removed, it has to take it off from its scheduling list. For cyclic communication, typically applicable in, in the case of control. So, you know, transfer process variable or transfer valve position. Valve position is just an example. So, it continuously has to take the process variable, compute the controls and then output to an output device. So, this uh, goes on, right. So, uh, this is an example of cyclic communication. So, if there is cyclic communication, what the, what the link active scheduler does is that it issues a CD or Compel data token to a to a particular device. So once the compel data token is given, this uh, this device to which this CD token was issued must respond with a data token, right? And then this it, it, this it will send on the bus, and then all the devices are actually all the time looking for the data. So so the device which needs the data token will actually uh, will receive it and will take it and then use it. For acyclic communication, acyclic communication typically occurs when you have alert or event notifications, you have some operator data update, sometimes you like to see some trends. So, you can ask for some trend data, you can change set points or you can change give other kinds of commands to change operating modes. 
collect uh, collect maintenance information etc so these are these are not cyclic information but demand driven sometimes if they are invoked then that communication has to be ob obtained for this the las polls each device with a with a with a pt token pt is a pt is a pass token so if you if if a device has something to communicate it will take the pass token and then will communicate if it doesn't have if it doesn't uh, have anything to uh, anything to communicate it will it will simply pass the token to the next device so whoever needs it will hold the token and then will transmit the data and the communication is actually organized overall into cycles called macro cycles and within each macro cycle so macro cycle is the basic cycle over which the over which the the communication is periodic and then within macro cycles you have elementary cycles so an elementary cycle is decided by the fastest by the device which needs to communicate the fastest so you know if you have so let's let, let's see the next example we'll we will understand it better so for example take this loop this this is a, this is a pid loop with say an analog input a pid and an analog output so these are you know, actually you know on 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 different devices and the analog input so they are all on the network and the analog input this is a this is a function block representation so virtually this ai must communicate with pid and then pid must communicate with ao and they are actually physically different devices so in this case you see that uh, suppose there are so this is an example you know of several devices so so, so suppose it can very well happen that one device needs to talk two times in in one second cyclic both are cyclic but another device needs to talk only once so you see how it is organized so you have a you have a so the macro cycle is actually decided by the slowest device so since here the slowest device talk needs to talk only every one second so therefore you have a one second macro cycle on the other hand the elementary cycles are decided by the fastest device so in this case the fastest device needs to talk twice in a second so therefore in one micro cycle macro cycle you have two elementary cycles so first time what happens is that see cd1 dt1 so the first device talks then cd2 dt2 the second device talks and then some time is in this elementary cycle some time is kept free this time is kept for the for uh, acyclic communication so if there is any acyclic communication requirement then this ptn and dtn suppose this some uh, nth device needs to do some acyclic communication so this pt will be passed and this and this dt will be transmitted now in the next micro cycle you see that because cd1 and dt1 speaks because it needs to talk twice in a second while cd2 and dt2 is skipped because the second device does not need to speak uh, twice in a second and this whole time is actually utilized for uh, for for acyclic communication and then the next two acyclic communication cycles go on and in the th so now this micro cycle macro cycle ends and the second macro cycle begins so the first elementary cycle of the second macro cycle is here in which again cd1 cd2 and cd2 uh, cd1 dt1 and cd2 dt2 will take place so this is the basic way in which the communication goes on here so for example see in that in that communication loop things are serialized also so first in this communication loop what happens is that first the ai101 to pid101 takes place so the analog input gives feedback to the pid controller then the pid controller uh, PID controller. Now the PID controller, as we had seen in the previous diagram, that the previous PID controller and the analog output devices were on the same physical device. So, so there is no need for communication. So this PID controller giving value to AO is there. There is no need for communication. But this analog output may may also be may also have to be transmitted to the host or some some operator station which wants to see what kind of outputs are going to the plant. So for that you need a communication so that is so so at this point of time so the here the analog input process computes input samples and then a communication is scheduled after this communication ends the pid data has got the result so it will compute 
and then the PID will directly give and then the AI block will, will compute this, this does not require any communication because the PID and the AO block are on the same physical device, no communication is required and then the AO block will communicate on the network with the host, right. So, this is the way the this 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 PID loop computation and and communication will go on. So, this brings us to the end of the lesson. So, let us review it. So, in this lesson, we have seen the basic introduction and and motivation of having a network. So, obviously, here I would like to make a comment that obviously there are there are advantages of having a network over you know a simple analog or point to point digital communication system. But one has to remember that the investments required for the field bus network, <coughs> all kinds of software, the smart field bus devices, all these things I mean the, the application domain must be large enough and must require uh, enough quality and enough. Uh, that is the cost of setting up this field but bus network must be justified. So, even if it is even if it is you know quite elaborate and gives lot of functionality, but uh, one should have need for that functionality and uh, using that functionality I mean revenue should uh, be should be returned. So, that is the this is we have this is another comment. So, introduction and motivation then we have seen the physical layer features and we have seen that how these are connected how these are to be connected and how using uh, repeaters and then the digital communication you can have very large networks and you can have wiring advantages and you can have very reliable data communication. Then we have seen the network protocol architecture and we have seen that it is basically some kind of an adaptation for the special purpose of plant wide control of the OSI layers and we have seen the what are the layers existing in the in the field bus architecture. Then we have seen the mechanisms for arbitrating communication rights among the network devices. So, how cyclic and acyclic communication goes on by and how centralized bus masters issue tokens to particular devices which take them and then transmit data. So, this brings us to the last thing points to ponder some questions. So, for what kind of application is the network such as field bus justified right. So, I raise this point immediately. So, you can think of some application where this will be justified. Why are network and transport layers absent in the field bus network? This also has been discussed. Which communication mode constitutes the dominant traffic cyclic or acyclic? So, you can think of the various process automation tasks and then decide which is mentioned two advantages of distributed control over centralized control. So, with this I would like to